Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Q Pod episode 67. I'm John Furrier, Dave Vellante. Dave, the salute is to you. Good to hey, see John. You. I'm in, in Bar What's Harbor. Going, brother? I'm in Maine right now, so I'm remote. Um, and it'll be kind of a short pod. I got the family wedding, so uh, it's great weather. Good to be back in Maine. Um, and it's just beautiful. It's, it, it, it's just just gorgeous coastline up here. It's just it's really nice, the national parks. But uh, great, great, uh, great area. Have you gone swimming yet? For... No, I don't go in the water. It's too oh, cold. Oh, water, man. It'll make your <laughs> toes curl. <laughs> it's like California. Good lobster, though. Freezing. Good lobster. Lobster, lobster's good. It's not like the cave where you can swim. You know, it's like it's not, South Shore and Cave is great. Um, Dave, episode 67, what a week. Last week, we talked about uh, the politics. Biden tapped out this week. Um, that was big news since our last pod. Kamala Harris is, is taking over. Um, you know, the, the uh, Democrats put their person in. Uh, she's from California, so we know a lot about her, uh, and we have I have an opinion on her. I think it's a good call because they circumvent the the process problem, and uh, you know, Democrats going to the, the machine is putting their candidate out, and I still think Trump wins. There's no way I think she beats Trump. I don't but, know. But, I don't you know. know. It's, 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 I mean, it's, we can we can chat about that. She raised a lot of dough in record time. It's amazing how she just basically boxed out everybody. I was hoping for an open convention. I thought that would have been amazing. But she just hit the phones, locked up all the endorsements, raised a bunch of cash, and now the polls are say, you know, basically saying neck and neck again. Yeah, we'll see. I mean, it's, it's going to be machine against machine, Democrat machine. And also it's a VP against VP pick. Her VP pick will be critical because – you know, you really have, I think, a generational torch passing moment where, you know, obviously Trump's Trump and everyone wants him gone. This is, he can't serve after this. But Kamala, you know, I, I think she's really not a real president because she really hasn't really won an election, according to, you know, if you look at the data, she went unopposed in the Senate. And she, the last race she actually was contested on was her attorney general seat. Um, and so she just pops into the spot as candidate. So we'll see if she got the juice to compete. But it's really about the VPs because I think the younger generation are walking away from this. And we we mentioned this before the pod. But what is what are we, what are we doing here? So you know a lot a lot to unpack there. Um, a lot of other news. Obviously, we're still reeling in the crowd strike and, and blowback, as we had predicted, um, was going to fall back on Microsoft. It did. They took a lot of heat. Crowd strike continues to get uh, under pressure. I mean, Delta got hit the worst in terms of the airlines, um, but really it was it was the human impact. People see the disruption. According to CrowdStrike CEO George Kurtz, he says 97% of all Windows sensors are back online. That's their product. Um, and uh, that's a week after they shipped the uh, faulty update that bricked all the uh, com Windows computers. Um, so we'll, we'll see that. And then, you know, just a lot of drama um, between people coming out for Trump um, and just, just all kinds of tech. It's funny, you mentioned Kamala Harris with that fundraising, the joke in Silicon Valley is she's like an AI startup, Series A, $83 million funding. I mean, she just got a windfall, which I think is a really interesting. And I think to your point, it's, it's a sign, Dave, that there's a rally moment behind her, no matter who the candidate is. It's all about beating Trump. This is what is happening. People flip flop. I mean, you had Reed Hoffman here in Silicon Valley who won one minute. I talked to Joe Biden for two hours and he was loosened on turn. I, we talked AI and then, you know, obviously he has to eat crap because you know a week later essentially he's you know senile and everyone's like okay you've got a problem now he's you know all oh it's all about kamala you know so i think there's a whole silicon valley vibe and then you got the all-in podcast david Sachs, who's been very vocal and he's taking a lot of shrapnel on twitter uh our x uh, on this and so you got that kind of republican you know tech crowd very interesting to see how that plays and of course this week i thought the big news that was kind of buried that was kind of inside baseball for the tech industry is that Meta uh, released the Llama 3.1. Uh, Amazon announced support for AWS. Just overall, just the AI stuff is just booming. That Llama 3.1 apparently is as good as is approaching the you know, comparable. I've been to, using it. I've been using it a um, lot it, for for this. For, tell, for, tell me what your experiences work. are. It is unreal. I mean, I, 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 you know, as you know, I, I use perplexity, I use ChatGPT, sometimes I use some Google stuff, but right now I am in love with Meta AI and Llama. I'm asking it to do stuff to, to put together, to analyze data, all this unstructured data and format it. And, and it's so fast. It's really amazing. But I, I wanted to just, I wanted to, before we get off Kamala, if I can, if I can just sort of touch on that. Yeah, definitely. My interest there 
is, well, there's so many things, but I'm really interested in the whole Lena Khan thing because J.D. Vance is saying, sort of leaning toward Lena Khan. Everybody at first thought, well, Trump will kick her out and maybe still will if he wins. And I, don't, I think now that's up in the air. It's a coin, uh, coin toss. But then the question is, how will Kamala uh, approach the FTC and Lena Khan? Barry Diller today on TV from Paris in an interview with Sorkin said, quote, Lena Khan is a dope. He, he literally <laughs> said that. And Andrew Ross Sorkin goes, you've left me speechless. But so his point was, and I totally agree with Barry Diller, not, not so much these, I don't think she's a dope, but I agree with what he said, which is, look, if a monopoly is using its monopoly power to do things illegally, like bundling, that should be regulated. Totally agree with him. But his point was that Lena Khan hates anything to do with any mergers that any company wants to do to drive efficiency, anything. She's just instant negative reaction, INR. And so to me, the big question with, with Kamala, we know where she stands on taxes. We know where she stands on climate. We, we think we know where she stands on DEI and, you know, we'll see about the border. Where does she stand on big tech and the FTC and Lena Khan? That's an unknown right now and something that I yeah. really hope – that they back off a little bit and have a better public and private partnership um, with this next administration. Yeah, I'm glad you brought up Lena Khan. I was about to just go into that. A um, couple things. One, um, in the news this week, Wiz walked away from Google uh, in a huge buy. I think it was a $23 billion acquisition by Google on Wiz, a cybersecurity company we've been following. We've been on the cube many times. And that was notable because they essentially saw the writing on the wall because Lena Khan was probably going to kill that deal. And they think they can go alone. I'm not saying Lena Khan killed that deal in advance, but that's the kind of action that we're seeing her influence prayer. And the other thing is, is that a couple of things is that Mark Andreessen and Ben Horowitz came up publicly this week to basically say that, um, you know, AI is an opportunity uh, for companies to, to be competitive, right? So, you know, the, the small, models we've been promoting the saying that's innovation and then lena khan goes on a, a pr tour basically and comes to silicon valley and does a presentation in front of y combinator the leading startup you know incubator uh and accelerator uh well known for it's it's a pedigree of, of startups and you know founded by paul graham who's you know a hardcore democrat attacking david sachs publicly this is a war going on but she comes in and presents her vision for open uh, competition. And she says that the open weights AI models can promote competition and liberate startups from the arbitrary whims of closed developers and cloud gatekeepers. That's a quote. Okay, Bloomberg has that report as well as uh, you know other folks. So you know, here she is now going on a, uh, almost a media blitz tour, trying to garner support from the Silicon Valley because she knows that if this falls to Kamala, She's got a win over Silicon Valley, and, and, and she's got competition in the sense that Mark Andreessen and Ben Horowitz, who are very influential in the startup ecosystem, are anti-Lena Khan, right? So, you know, Dave, very interesting. And, and the fact that she went to Y Combinator was, is, was unbelievable. So I got a couple so, of questions for I, you. I, I think – Go ahead. Sorry. Okay, go ahead. Well, first of I all – I just find it – Go ahead. Finish your thought, and I got a couple of questions. So I just find it. Questions. I just find it ironic. I just find it ironic that that she's doing that. I mean, like you know, that that, that to me shows that she's aware of the issues. Well, she's no that's dope. What I'm, that's my she, point. She's no dope. Barry, Barry Diller's wrong about that, <clears throat> but she's she's an ideologue, and <clears throat> she's trying to force her ideology and and basically bend the laws, in my opinion. But my question to you is. Given that so many in Silicon Valley have come out in favor of Trump, this is when Biden was you know, still committing to run, will that change now that, that Kamala has raised so much money and is, has so many unknowns? I mean, if she's smart, she'll, she, she's got the thing locked up. She doesn't need to tack to the left, but she may anyway. Uh, to go you know, Bernie and an anti-crypto and Liz Warren, if she's smart, in my opinion, she'll tack to the middle. Will that bring some of the Silicon Valley elites, some of the power brokers back to the Democrat party, or are they, in your opinion, locked in to the Trump momentum? I mean, I think it's a, it's a jump ball right now. Um, you're starting to see this post debate with, with Biden, you know, downfall and the deterioration of his health. 
uh, and his cognitive side of it going mainstream. There's been a shift towards the Democrat. I've heard people say um, publicly and also kind of privately that, you know, if Trump and the Republicans just supported, um, uh, you know, the right to choose, OK, which is, you know, abort the abortion issue. OK, if they just aligned with that, that they would essentially run the table. OK, so, you know, the, the, the religion side, the Bible thumpers or the people who are super religious don't really make up a bunch of the, that right wing piece. But I think the one thorny issue is abortion. And I think that's going to be, to me, a problem for the for the Republicans. Now, everywhere else, the tech community is pretty much optimistic, right? And this is whole Lena Khan's whole thing. She basically is coming out and co-opting the message from Mark Andreessen and Ben Horowitz and a bunch of other people who are promoting a pro-tech agenda, pro-innovation, pro-startups, obviously VCs that care about that. In fact, the catchphrase that's being kicked around, I mean, we've been covering AI, we call it small language models, small models, especially models, will dominate the enterprise and then the AI agenda as it gets infused everywhere. But the catchphrase that's being used in this supporting this tech optimism view is called the little tech agenda. Little tech is the term, Dave. What they mean by that is startups. And again, her she co-opted that in the quote I just um, quoted Bloomberg on, which was, you know, they see a problem with the gatekeepers, right? So, you know, closed developers, you know, liberate startups from the arbitrary whims of closed developers and cloud gatekeepers. They're talking about open AI, Microsoft, AWS. That's what they're talking about. So, you know, the, the whiz t- walking away from Google, I think that was a pretext to what we're seeing with the threat of, you know, holding deals up. Remember Canva? They had that big yep. thing with Adobe, and then that that went sideways. They lost almost all their value tied up in the dance. You mean, closed uh, the deal. You mean Figma? Figma, I'm sorry, not can Figma, yeah, Figma. And so Figma, that deal was done. Everyone was going to get liquid. Everyone was going to make a lot of money. And then that, that went sideways. That's the consequence. Now, I think Wiz probably saw that and said, we already got a monster valuation. Our business is booming. Why would you want to go down that road? Lena Khan's posturing, like, come on, come to the lion's den. We're gonna, we'll evaluate you too. So I think this whole, you know, competition, open weights, AI can liberate starts. This little tech agenda is the coined term. It's just about startups. How does a startup compete? And we've talked about this in the podcast many times. How does a startup compete when in AI, it's very um, easy to imitate features? If you're, a, if you're an Amazon, you've got scale or on Google. You know, there's a lot of white space opportunities for startups, but it's not company building like the next Airbnb potentially. So I think there's real fear that the startups need these little spaces to get in and, and, and grow. Now, Lena Khan is taking that position of pro-tech. She's not saying, you know, uh, I'm an anti-tech. She's just, she's anti-big. Which, yeah, you know, she's, okay. She's anti-big I, I can tech. see that. She's anti-big she's tech. Anti- I mean, it, it, if but, if it if it flinches big tech, she's all over independent of the issues. So this is the nuance. So, of but big but, tech. but but big tech and startups oftentimes align. I I mean, I get she's she's not completely. I, I don't uh, everything Lena does Khan does is not bad. Uh, but I, I know I'm always ranting against Lena Khan because the the good part of what she does is that a big tech company can take out a small company and kill it and kill the competition. But at the same time, they can do things like create Instagram and and create YouTube at scale. And those are great things for consumers. And so right now, uh, Little Tech uh, has no IPO path for liquidity. And they've got a much tougher path uh, for M&A. And so that means that venture capitalists are are going to be less likely or less enthusiastic not that they won't continue to spend they will but you got to have exit paths for these people now the other thing i would say a couple things um on on whiz i i I hung out at rsa with you know and costica who's the co-founder of whiz he runs product merit bear uh is tight with those guys we're tight with merit we were hanging out with merit went to the whiz party Spent a lot of time with the, with with you know, and I, I I pinged him, you know, messaged him, saying I was stoked that they remain independent. I'm actually really happy about that. I think it would have been a great move for Google, but I'm really thrilled to see an Israeli-based startup get to IPO because that doesn't happen often. You know, it's very rare. They usually you know get sold. So I'd love to see that, you know, uh, uh, 
that, that Silicon Valley-like ethos, you know, go to Israel and turn into IPOs. That, that's huge. The second thing I wanted to say in some of your comments is, you know, Lena Khan talks about when, when the CrowdStrike thing happened, she's like, see, see what ha finger wagging, see what happens when you have consolidate all this power uh, and you have very few companies controlling things. Well, look, you got three U.S. hyperscalers, AWS, Microsoft, and Google, spending hundreds of billions of dollars in CapEx to build awesome infrastructure that allows us to have choice. There's so much competition between those three companies. So this idea that, that it stifles competition, it does at one end of the spectrum, and I understand that, but those three companies are doing great service building out infrastructure, spending money like crazy, and that's something that the entire startup community can build on top of. You, well, you know well how many startups were spawned directly thanks to AWS and, and the innovation that they created with the cloud. So I don't buy this notion that these companies are hurting competition. If they do things illegally, like Microsoft does sometimes with bundling, you know, if Amazon's you know, playing games with its, with, its, with its suppliers, okay, regulate that or punish them for that. You know, or if Google's gaming, you know, the, the blue links and hurting, you know, the ecosystem, that should be regulated. But on balance, that regulation, I think, is a better outcome you know, when directed and targeted than breaking those companies up. I think breaking them up would, would be a disaster. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, they provide a lot of value. And again, we're in the, we're in the second cycle of eight hyperscalers being in the market. And when I say second cycle, I mean, as an innovation engine, the first cycle where they're full, fully built out at scale. And I think we have yet to see what that next Instagram is going to look like. So, I mean, I kind of like the little tech agenda, don't, don't like the term because it's not little tech. It's just AI, right? AI will be yeah. key. Um, and then we'll keep an eye on, F on the FTC and Lena Khan. But I just found it like a little bit more humanizing that Lena Khan was out in the field. Um, so Dave, a lot of earnings came out um, next week. Next week, we got Microsoft and the big, and the big guys coming out um, with, with uh, Intel, Amazon, Apple, uh, Cloudflare, a bunch. IBM just had earnings. We got the Super Cloud event coming up. And then we have this month, we're doing a special kind of we call digital twin put that in quotes it's not about digital twins but we're going to replicate um uh, a physical event that was a network event with cube and nysc um and nysc had all the top silicon valley ai people together uh, right before the eve of the databricks event um and so they're all like hitters i'm like wow, i wish i had my camera so we're going to create a little program flash cube if you will bring them in on august 1st and we're going to have tons of names there so um, you know, we got the, the CEO, uh, founder of Salibris. We got chairman, CEO of Pure Storage, Charlie G, uh, Giancarlo. We have the CMO of AMD, the CTO of Juniper Networks, Untethered AI, Scale Flux, uh, CEO, founder Sam Bonova, a lot of chip companies, um, tons of tons of people. Super Cloud um, is coming up. Um, and we just had another event last week with Super Micro. Dave, a lot of studio action this summer. I got to say, this is the summer of, of Cube Studio Love. Yeah, I mean, same as awesome. last summer. Remember last summer we had three super studios, including Super Cloud. We got Super Cloud 7. Just one thing. Uh, so you mentioned IBM earnings, uh, uh, ServiceNow earnings. Did you see the news on CJ Desai? I did. ServiceNow, he's stepping down. Yeah, Big under time. pressure um, of, of supposedly like violating company hiring policy i guess he hired the army cio about a year ago and i don't know somehow that's not cool i guess when you're selling to the army but i thought it was disclosed i don't know i like cj uh good guy we know him from his days at emc i we've interviewed him many times when he was at his service now um but uh, yeah I, I don't know i mean I, he he's always seemed to me to be a, a pretty straight shooter and ethical guy but he's taken the fall on this one but ServiceNow, you know, continues to do well. IBM had a what I thought was a decent quarter. The stock didn't necessarily act great yesterday, but I thought IBM was um, was pretty strong. The revenues were up four percent. Mainframe was strong. Its transaction processing was up like double digits. It dragged a bunch of storage with it. You know, Red Hat bookings were up twenty percent, even though it was a little soft. So hybrid cloud seems to be working. So you know, IBM and ServiceNow to me were were strong people were a little concerned about alphabet but i thought alphabet google cloud platform was strong the only thing people are concerned about google is they're spending so much on capex and they're not, it's not paying off yet but we know that they're 
they're investing in the future, as, as is, to my earlier point, Amazon, as are Amazon and Microsoft. And to me, that's a gift to the industry. So, but I mean, we, we've been saying this, the, the ROI in the enterprise is gonna take longer. Um, hitting a lot of singles today, uh, and then the, you know, the big hits are gonna come for, to those companies that invest now. You know, it's not magic. It, AI is not magic. I mean, it looks like magic sometimes, but it's not magic in terms of transforming your company overnight. There are still people, there's processes, yeah. there's customers, there's supply chains, there's ecosystems that, you know, all have to be thought out and re-architected. But, but so a couple of bright spots yeah. there, I think, in, in, in the earnings, even though tech took a huge hit this week. Um, you know, NASDAQ was down, <laughs> I think, like what, five or 600 points uh, a couple of days ago. Um, but CrowdStrike's back up today. CrowdStrike's up a couple percentage points and, you know, in early trading. And so, um, yeah, I mean, I think Goldman it's Sachs had a target of 400 on that. And I think they'll go, I mean, CrowdStrike is going to lick their wounds. And I, I still predict that they're going to surge. Like we talked about in detail on our last podcast. So check out the last episode, uh, 66. Uh, we go into great detail. I think people might consider switching, but the switching costs are so high. I don't think, I think CrowdStrike's number one in endpoint protection and, and what they do. And I think they're going to continue to grow. I think they're going to put this behind them. It's going to be water under the bridge. They'll, they'll pop back up once it settles in. Once is, when people realize that no one's fleeing for the exits, um, you know, they might lose some customers here and there, but for the most part, they were probably already gone. Well, we'll um, track. I don't it. see crowd strike. We'll track it. We had the yeah, speaking, uh, of, speaking of we had the flash early, tracking. early on, and it was a lot of emotional bias. Uh, but when it got down to how hard it is to move off the of crowd strike, it's not trivial. But we'll see. We'll be tracking it. We 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 were able to track Okta. Obviously, we, we solar solar winds and Okta after their <laughs> hacks, and and in the case of Okta, they just poorly communicated it. Solar winds just got hit with a novel you know, supply chain attack, and it really hurt their business. Yeah. Okta did not handle the communications well, and that combined with the Auth0, the, the poor Auth0 integration and how they screwed up the go-to-market has hurt the stock and hurt the momentum dramatically. But we will be able to see in the data, in the spending data, what happens to CrowdStrike. We're watching that very closely. I, I tend to lean toward what you're saying. I think they're such a good company. I think they're being really transparent. I think they're coming out and, and saying exactly what happened. Um, even though they're taking a lot of heat, why well, do this on a Friday? And, you know, you pissed on our process and all this other stuff. <laughs> I, I think they are doing everything that a, a, a company needs to do in this situation in terms of being transparent with its communications. George Kurtz is evidently going to get hauled in front of Congress. So we'll see how that goes. Um, I think if he's humble and he's conciliatory and he's apologetic and he says exactly what happened and exactly what they're going to do such that it doesn't happen again, I agree with you. I think they'll be just fine. That's going to be a comedy show when he's in front of Congress. It's going to be like, what's, how's the internet work? I mean, yeah. they don't even know how the internet works. Never mind how cybersecurity works. And again, this is Microsoft. This falls on Microsoft. Again, like, like Microsoft is the systems that, that needed the update and their, their piece of it. Anyway, so so I want to get into two things with you right now. Because this, I know it's a summer pod. I'm, I'm, a, I'm out on vacation. But there's, there's a couple things I want to unpack. I want to unpack the whole survey we have coming out, data coming out around Snowflake and Databricks, because I think that's going to be a very big tell sign of how the platformization of this new data layer is coming and going to come out. Um, we've had a variety of different startups we've interviewed. We've obviously covered Snowflake and Databricks. Uh, and you mentioned uh, Lena Khan and the whole role of the hyperscaler. So I want to also, before we get into the Databricks new data we got to share here, and we're going to share in great detail on Tuesday next week, is um, the market share... Uh, that the cube research is doing and you know we were in deep in this for years um you guys have been tracking and you specifically have been tracking aws google and microsoft's you know revenue forecasts and you know for the folks out there listening the cube research which has you know been around for 14 years formerly wikibon now cube just got many more analysts now we're growing really really fast and doing again continuing a great mission of free research but what people don't know dave and i want you to explain we have a multifaceted approach to estimating quarterly revenues you know, documenting, squinting through the earnings, going in, looking at um, uh, research that we do in the marketplace, insight from experts in our network, and also looking at, you know, how the cloud services are developing. So can you share how you see the AWS, um, Google, Microsoft revenue share um, portfolio, how it's cracking down? Because 
you know, I've been saying almost for a decade now that Microsoft sandbags their SaaS number, right? So, you know, it's, it's, it's kind of complicated. But with Gen AI, this is important because you start to see more apps come in at the platform level and potentially squeak into the SaaS category, which has not been AWS's sweet spot because they don't have a real SaaS platform like Google uh, and Microsoft. Microsoft obviously well known for having their own applications. And if you look at the numbers, I mean, you get what, almost 100 billion in revenue, right? Over 100 billion in revenue for AWS yep. um, and Google. Can you share how you see the service layers breaking down? Is there any new segmentation data? What's tracking in the cloud with, you know, between AWS? What's the real deal? And, and, and if I help us squint through that, I want to get sure. into this. I think it's super important to set that up. So as we all know, AWS created the cloud and they, they basically an infrastructure company, IS and, and PaaS. And, and the lines between IS and PaaS are sometimes fuzzy. You know, when it comes to compute, storage, and networking, they're pretty clear. Although having said that, there's a lot of managed services and other sort of layers that you would consider PaaS. Um, you know, is Elastic Beanstalk PaaS? I, I would say yes. You know, some people might call it IS. But at any rate, so, so AWS comes out to your point they'll do about $100 billion this year. The vast majority of AWS's business historically has been compute. You know, we know this from our own AWS bill. You look at it, it's EC2 is the big big driver. I mean, compute, you know, was probably, you know, years ago, 68 to 75% of AWS's revenue. And that has come down dramatically over the last several years as a function of them building out other services and doing a great job with the ecosystem and the marketplace. Our estimate is that, that uh, that that compute is now under sixty percent of AWS's revenue last year, and I think it's 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 trending down even further. So the the in order of importance, it's compute, it's it's database, it's storage, it's analytics. You know, data transfer is obviously a big piece of that, and networking, uh, and then kind of everything else. You know, they have this huge long tail of other services, and that adds up to you know roughly 100 billion. Most of that is IS, probably 60, 70 percent. Let's call it 70, even 75 percent, mid 70s. And then the balance is is PaaS. And when we talk about PaaS, we put database in PaaS. Uh, we put uh, the machine learning stuff. A lot of the analytics stuff is PaaS. Um, you know, and you could argue, well, maybe that should be SaaS, but we don't count it as SaaS. It's really sort of just above infrastructure. And the security's in there. We, we put security in, in, in the infrastructure unless it's a SaaS service. Now, increasingly, AWS is starting to sell SaaS. An example, if Chime is an example. Chime's not a big business. Uh, but Q is an example. A AWS Connect is an example. So we're seeing more of that. They get a tiny little piece of professional services added up. It's roughly $100 billion. Now, when you go to yeah. Google and, and Microsoft, Google was started, as you know, with G Suite, right, which now is Workspace. It's over half of their cloud revenue. When, when Google announces or reports it, the Google Cloud, it, the number it gives includes all that Workspace, all that SaaS revenue, and, and over half, you know, probably 55, even maybe closer to 60% is SaaS. Um, and then so their IaaS business is much more compute driven because it's early days and they've got a past business as well. They do great with BigQuery, but their business is much, much smaller than than AWS. You know, it's still big. It's, you know, tens of billions, but it's not it's not 100 billion. Microsoft is huge. Microsoft's well over 100 billion when you look at its Microsoft cloud, but its reporting is so opaque. They have an intelligent cloud category. They have the Microsoft cloud category. Azure's in both. They include hybrid stuff, they include on-prem, they include licenses, so I like to look at the Microsoft Cloud. If you look at the Microsoft Cloud, let's call it 130 billion, well over half of that is Microsoft 365, Dynamics, the Power Platform, all that SaaS. Okay, so their IaaS and PaaS is much, much smaller, I think, than people realize, and remember, during the Activision trial, it got leaked what the size of their, the true size of their Azure business was, and it was probably 75% of what the consensus was 
because the Wall Street consensus, they just take what Microsoft says on Microsoft Cloud and say, oh, that's, that's cloud, that's the same as AWS Cloud. It's not, it's not apples to apples. So long-winded way of saying to get to apples to apples, you really gotta peel, yeah. peel the onion and Microsoft and Google don't make it easy for obvious reasons. They don't wanna highlight the fact that they're not as big in, yeah. what, in the business that AWS started. Now, having said all that, AWS, I'm certain, is, is got to be looking at this saying, hey, there's a big market in SaaS. How do we get it? And historically, as we've talked about with Jerry Chen, they've, they've, uh, they've tapped that market through partners, but increasingly we're seeing little bits and pieces like Connect, like Q, where they're starting to step into that SaaS business. Big opportunity for them. Yeah. I mean, Microsoft's IaaS and past business has grown. They're catching up to Amazon, right? So, yep. um, where do you see the compute piece? I mean, let me ask you a question because this is a good segue into the database, data piece. Database has always been a big part of the business. And we've seen companies like MongoDB be great partners for, say, AWS because they drive a lot of compute. So, you know, if you're in the ecosystem and you're a database company, yeah, you're good. Cool. So what does the database market look like? Because analytics business is shifting to data engineering. So... What's your take on the cloud position vis-a-vis -vis database in the past layer? Well, I think I think Snowflake is is a really good example. Was a post Snowflake partnership with AWS and the Databricks example, the partnership they have with Microsoft. You know, even that, even though that's shifting thanks to the open AI, but still a lot of people using you know Azure Databricks. Um, those are the two best examples because if you if you go back to last decade, sort of early to mid last decade, there was a new stack emerging, <clears throat> and the stack was the hyperscale AWS in particular, and then on top of that, it was Snowflake as the DBMS, and then Databricks as the machine learning engine, and those three platforms together were creating this new stack, and then. Frank Slootman came in and raised all this money. Ali Goetze saw a huge opportunity. He raised a bunch of money, and they both said, we want to be everything to everybody. So Snowflake started to get into machine learning. They started to buy BI companies. They bought you know, a company like Streamlit. They started to do a bunch of acquisitions. At the, at the same time, Databricks realized that it was behind in, in, in database, if I can use that term. They create the lake house market, and so now you've got Snowflake, which is ahead in DBMS, and you've got Databricks that's ahead in machine learning and AI, <clears throat> and you've got each company now going after each company's base. And they have created essentially the new modern data platforms, which are defined by being in the cloud, being able to separate compute from storage, <clears throat> and driving now machine learning and, and gen AI from Databricks standpoint. As you well know, John, they came in during the Hadoop era. They... they they brought Spark to the table. Every thought, everybody thought they were going to do what Cloudera did with Cloudera's crappy business model, but Databricks was way smarter than that. They just started doing managed services. They embraced the cloud, and they basically you know, dramatically simplified uh, data pipelines with the Spark execution engine, and then from there, it built out just an incredibly awesome business. And the last thing I'll say is the data shows very clearly that Databricks has more momentum right now than Snowflake. Snowflake's obviously a bigger company, but when, when you think about what's happening, there's a big shift going on in terms of the point of control. It used to be the DBMS. It's now shifting to the governance layer. But the source of value is not necessarily at the governance layer because that's all going open source with Unity and Polaris. So the source of value is now around these AI and ML tool chains. So that's the next big battle, the, both the governance yeah. to be the point of control, but then the value add on top of that. And I would say right now, based on the data that I see, there's no question that, that that's Databricks wheelhouse. They've got an advantage yeah. there. I think they have a slight advantage in the governance race uh, and th with the fact that, yeah. you know, they, they, they've, they've been working on Unity for a while uh, and they just bought Tabular, which is the whole open table format debate that we we can talk about so they've got a slight advantage now but the jury's still out and there's a lot of yeah. loyalty in the snowflake the last thing i'll say there is a lot of customers will say look governance is security and governance are first and so we will sacrifice openness to stay in within a closed platform because it's safer at the same mm -hmm. time everybody's saying there's so much optionality on the around compute engines out there with Starburst and Data Mesh and Trino and uh, alternatives in the hyperscale, 
we want to be able to control our own data. And that's Ali Goetze's message. And that's resonating to the point where even Snowflake is embracing open tables, open formats like yeah. Iceberg. Yeah, and this is a great, great uh, link to what I wanted to talk about this, with the survey we're going to be announcing next week. Because if you look at the, the cloud players like AWS and where their revenue is coming from, you just laid that out. Um, great commentary on on kind of the, the use cases and workloads. But if you look at the market, with Gen AI, you're seeing this in all the conversations. Oh, on-prem, you know, we're going to do these new capabilities. If you look at the old pre-generative AI market, you got the clouds and you got databases. I think, and I think if you look at the Amazon Web Services ecosystem, for example, you know, you start to see the on-prem hybrid platforms emerging. Most customers have SQL Server, Oracle, Mongo, Couchbase, HANA, MySQL, yep. you know, Postgres. Um, and so you got you got pre-existing diversity of databases, which by the way, we think is is relevant. I mean, I've been saying for years, diversity, no, no one database will rule the world. You know, all, everyone at Amazon, the cloud players say the same thing. But now that you got this platformization of generative AI happening, which is really the big trend right now, everything is being re-engineered at the data layer based upon what capabilities come out. For example, Meta, Meta's new Llama um, engine um, on, on AWS really has got training and built in. So Amazon's putting their silicon innovation there. So you have all this infrastructure coming out that's going to accelerate the compute and the capabilities. So now the, the, the shift is on this new platformization. So I think the Snowflake Databricks market, I call that those two of the big players, okay, really represent what's going to happen because the lake houses, the data lakes are the new way to create that linkage and glue between the databases. So if you got a columnar store over here, an old Vertica system, or you got some database over here, you can bring it all together and, and connect them. And this is where the action is. So tell us, give us a, a taste of the results of the survey we did, um, serving joint Databricks and Snowflakes accounts. What, what, what are they doing? How are they viewing the market? What does the survey say? Well, what, did, what was the purpose of the survey? Um, because polling the database still accounts good because it's going to give you a tell sign. It's also tell you who's got the better strategy. We, we saw it at full display, Snowflake so, strategy at their event, Databricks at their event. This is a tell sign. T give us a result. So what's, the genesis, what's what's, what's, the genesis of the survey, this is how awesome our partnership is with ETR. In fact, I put out a little teaser on Twitter saying, hey, we, we're going to be releasing the data from 105 joint Databricks and Snowflake accounts, one of the analysts chimed in and goes, well, that's a pretty small N, 105. You know, if you want to slice it and dice it by industry and geography, that's going to be kind of tough. I'm like, yeah, that's true, but that wasn't our intent. We're all about speed. So the Friday before I left on vacation, I texted Eric Bradley at ETR and said, hey, what do you think about doing a flash survey ahead of SuperCloud of joint Snowflake and Databricks customers? He called me up. He goes, okay, yeah, let's, let's do a small N because it'll keep our costs down, frankly. And it's mm -hmm. still, it still gets you good data. And so he said, let's do 50. I said, great. And uh, we, do, we just, as long as we can get the data before SuperCloud, then we can feature that at SuperCloud 7. And he's coming on today and breaking analysis, and we're going to preview it. So the intent was to look at the two leaders in the market, Snowflake and Databricks, who have defined the modern data platform, and try to get an understanding of, of for, so first of all, get joint customers. That was really important. We wanted customers of both. Um, and to try to understand what their thinking was in terms of machine learning and Gen AI, Gen AI in particular, and governance models. So given the open sourcing of Polaris, the open sourcing of Unity, the acquisition by Databricks of Tabular, which uh, Brian Blue and his co-founders invented, you know, created Iceberg, which is the hot open table format, what other what what other databases are in play? Uh, what what the attitudes are toward each of these companies, and what the governance strategies are? So it turned out, <clears throat> ETR is so amazing. We ended up instead of fifty, we got one hundred and five in record time. Okay, we already have the data, and we're parsing through it and analyzing it. What does it say? It basically says it confirms certainly the wheelhouse of Snowflake is data warehousing. But I was surprised at how strong uh, Databricks is in that space. And that's because they mm -hmm. kind of did the whole lake, lake house thing. At the same time, it shows that 
the Databricks wheelhouse of machine learning, they have a big advantage there, and Snowflake's got some work to do. You know, even though our other survey data shows that, you know, Snowflake's doing okay in that space, but they're not considered by these 105 customers anyway, which is a really good representative sample of large customers. They're not, Snowflake is not considered as much of a leader in AI and Gen AI as is Databricks. So Snowflake has some work to do there, but, but Snowflake definitely has a presence. As it relates to open table formats, the, the sentiment is absolutely governance has to come first. Security and governance are job one. And while they love the idea of open table formats, they're not going to go all in, for the most part, until they figure out the governance model. So then you say, okay, what about the governance model? Most people didn't even know that Unity and Polaris were open sourced, first of all. Um, many, many did. Uh, but in the case of Polaris, it's early. People are just investigating. They're kicking the tires. In the case of Unity, there are actually quite a few people that are, that are using Unity and headed in that direction. But it's still very much uncertain as to what they're going to place their bets on. And the other piece, I would say, is there's still a lot of Hive out there. You remember Hive. No schema on right, just create the data swamp. Okay, so people are dealing with a lot of Hive. And tabular is by far the number one area of, oh, sorry, tab, I said tabular. Iceberg by far is the number one table format of interest for open table formats, more so than Hootie, more so than Delta. And we know that Databricks wants to bring those two together, but technically they haven't done it yet. They're trying to do it. That's part of the reason why they bought tabular. And the last thing I'll say is 40% of the customers that we surveyed said they're going to make no change to their Databricks and or Snowflake uh, estates. But a huge portion, you know, almost 50% said they actually plan to consolidate their ML and AI and data operations either, on, either onto Databricks or Snowflake from the other platform in the next two years to some degree. Not, not whole rip and replace. Very few are going to do that. But there's definitely some shifting going on. And we know from conversations with customers that part of that shifting is cost pressures in, in Snowflake. Yep. They want to do some of the data engineering and pipelining work outside of Snowflake because they say it's more expensive to do it inside. Snowflake counters with that saying, no, no, we have all this other wonderful capabilities around it. And I think what's, what's going to happen is I think Snowflake's going to come up with new pricing uh, for those types of workloads. I think they're going to create a new SKU that's a low-cost SKU to try to hang on to that, just as they've embraced open table formats like Iceberg, just as they've uh, uh, announced uh, open sourcing Polaris, which is just a technical metadata catalog. And so right now, I would say in conclusion, I would say Databricks has the edge in ML and AI and Gen AI. I think at the same time, because the jury's still out on governance and security, that Snowflake has that, you know, that Snowflake blue blanket of comfort, and that's going to keep people yeah. on their platform for a long time. And, and it, to your point about, you know, earlier on the election, this is still jump ball. But the last thing I'll say is I feel as though Databricks is in its home court and Snowflake yeah. is playing an away game. If I had a bet, if I had a set of betting line, I would say uh, Databricks would be minus – 115 snowflake yeah. i would say plus 110 yeah it's it's interesting to me it's like football or soccer what do you what do you coach which game are we playing here and you can call it both in england they call it football uh, in the u.s they call it soccer so you know to me to me i've always said that snowflake and databricks are going to win together and here's what's interesting we saw some of that shifting around managing pricing but if you look at the workloads date in the survey what jumped out at me is is that i think databricks is winning the platform of Gen AI, because what all they've been doing is investing in um, platform-like features, targeted developers. They are essentially saying, and they're direct about this, and, and that's their point of view and everything that they do, build on us, build on the lake house. Throw all your stuff in here and we code us. Snowflake is a little bit different. They ran the table with the analytics market. So if you look at the workloads, I think the tell sign, if you unpack this, if you look at the Snowflake use cases and their workloads versus Databricks, you see completely different markets. You see, you know, basically Snowflake took over the data warehouse market in my yeah. mind and cloud, and they had the analytics and they won, ran the table. 
I think their personas are different. You know, if you look at um, Snowflake, they win, I call the corporate kind of business intelligence, the data lakes in there, but it's really warehouse analytics, BI, business intelligence. Databricks, because of the spark and their technical acumen, really had ML coming out of the gate. Obviously, it's Berkeley driven, University of California, well known for their tech. You know, Ali Godz, he's a professor there, and you know, Matai, he's not technically Stanford, but you know, these guys are alpha geeks when it comes to machine learning. They breathe it. So I think the AI was a lucky, lucky tailwind for them. Not lucky, but they took advantage of it. They're in the analytics space, hardcore data science, but data engineering is at the top of the list of the workload. ML and AI are right underneath it. If you look at Snowflake, data management and machine learning is at the bottom of the use case stack. When they look at their the number of workloads statistically in the enterprise. So that tells me one of two things is going to happen. If Snowflake goes off the reservation and tries to be Databricks, they might be not optimized as a company. If Databricks tries to be Snowflake, they lose the momentum on the uh, and data engineering side of the ML AI piece. So it's interesting. So, but this speaks to this platformization, Dave, of data. This is a, a very nuanced piece, but it's happening. You're going to see enterprises start to retool. You know, we interviewed Uber, for instance, that came on theCUBE. You know, they basically created the data lake concept in production. Now they, they built it by hand. You know, Databricks just leveraged that. But the idea that you have a lake and you have a glue layer between multiple databases, purpose built for generative AI, that's an opportunity. And that was not in play a few years ago. A few years ago, it was data warehouse in the cloud. Yeah. Here's your analytics, e easy to use, good pricing model cloud leverage, clearly it's shifted to apps. So I, I, this is going to be a huge survey. We're going to keep track of this. I mean, this is going to be a big part of our SuperCloud 7 event coming up on Tuesday. Um, and so if you're, wa you're watching and listening to this, check out uh, the SuperCloud 7, go to cube.net, check in SiliconANGLE. We'll be covering like a blanket, a lot of big names coming in. Well, in in we concert. We have Ali and Benoit. Ali is CEO of Databricks, and Benoit is the co-founder of Snowflake. So, uh, and I, I like your analysis, John, the way you squinted through this data, because you're right. Snowflake stronghold is data warehouse. They've got the advantage there. Databricks stronghold is uh, MLAI, as you pointed out, data engineering. They've got the, 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 the advantage there. But when you look at data transformation, BI and visualization, even even ad hoc analysis, building apps on top of these platforms, and even the data catalog, the data basically shows that they're they're each neck and neck. I'd say slight advantage to Databricks, to be to be honest with you. And so, that's interesting. And I and I want to tie it into something you shared with me, one of our community members. So I, I won't mention his name, uh, but he likened Snowflake and Databricks to Cloudera and HortonWorks. You know who I'm talking about. Um, but the, here's the difference, uh, you know, Cloudera and Hortonworks, they got it all started. Hortonworks was kind of the open source all the way model. Cloudera, you know, had the sort of open core, uh, but they both had crappy business models and neither of them, you know, th had a, had a really attractive, you know, free cash flow and an attractive business. And they struggled, uh, from a business model standpoint, you can't say that about Snowflake and Databricks. They have great business models. You know, we don't know exactly how profitable um, Data, Databricks is, but yeah. they are inherently profitable. I really believe that. They are operating, if they wanted to turn on the ATM, they could, uh, but they're going, yeah. they're going growth. And they're, they have, they're both great businesses that I think have durable business models. It's not going to be Cloudera and Hortonworks all over again. I think it's no, no way. Yeah, I, it's not going to happen. I think it's two great companies, and I think they both. And that's the other thing the survey data shows. Now, granted, it's Snowflake and Databricks customers, but they both have advantages relative to the cloud players. And the great thing for the cloud players is they can make money off of Snowflake and Databricks selling compute and storage. It's just, it's it's a beautiful thing for customers because they have choice, and they're they're great businesses all around. So. Just government, stay out of it. <laughs> well, I wrote a post leading up to Databricks, kind of teasing out the Cloudera Hortonworks problem. And, and what I was posturing was, is that if the market doesn't make it easy to use, uh, it's going to be critical. Now, the difference between this market, and I think Ali Godsey gets this 100%. I think he's more tuned into it because he lived it. Snowflake guys came out of Oracle and they got the great product. I think they're both going to be great businesses. The market's in their favor. The market was ripe 
for Snowflake when they launched. The market is ripe now. Customers are actively deploying new data layer models to support their new applications that are coming. Clearly, you point out that whole new stack that's coming on. Okay, so Cloudera, they were making the market and Hadoop as a product wasn't good enough. Okay, it was very purpose built. It took a lot of expertise to run and that ultimately killed it. So combination of market readiness uh, and product fit was not there. I mean, the right answer was there. Big data was awesome. But now the market forces are clearly moving fast. And this is where, again, the platformization of data is coming fast. That's why data engineering, I believe, will rise to the top of the most important skill in an enterprise. As the infrastructure players come out with more capability, you're gonna see, you're gonna see a lot more data action. So there it is. I think you know, I, I mean there that's we're gonna I, we're gonna watch carefully. And I, and I think the big trend that we see is that shift in the point of control, the new moat, some people call it, from the DBMS to the governance catalog, but the value is leapfrogging that. And that value, as we've talked about, is now how do I take all these tool chains, all these machine learning and AI tool chains and orchestrate them? That's the new value layer to drive new levels, like literally five, 10 X levels of automation and, and productivity in organizations. That's the big yeah. battle right now. And it's frankly wide open. And I guarantee the hyperscalers are gonna be there. They're, they're sitting back and saying, great, this, uh, we love this. We love all this explosion of innovation. We're going to take advantage of it. It's just more choice for our customers. And we're going to sell infrastructure and software along with it. And um, I just, I just, I just love it. I'm really optimistic about the future of data. Well, Dave, I got to run. I got a family wedding. I got to awesome. pay attention to. You, I know you got to go. Appreciate getting the pod done. Um, just a plug with the SuperCloud Seven event. And then we're going to on August first. We're going to have a lot. We're going to have a special new series around AI, hardware, and infrastructure in Silicon Valley leaders and executive series. We got startups, uh, Butler IO, uh, Axido, I'm Tether AI. We got uh, some stealth companies, uh, Lumit, Equinix, Lambda Labs. We got SEMA AI. And we got Dial Arm Pad, coming Samba in, right? Nova. Arm's coming in. And Arm, coming in. we got Cerebra CEO. They're going public. We're going to hear Amazing. all, it's mainly a semiconductor. This is innovation. This is Pure where action and video is going to be Charlie, there. Cumulo, Pure Storage, Arm, um, Celestial AI. Just so mix between startups and this is tech leaders. This is CEO executive series. We're going to have a lot of content. We're going to stream that mid August. So this is in partnership with Brian Bauman over at the NYSE and Lynn Martin, their team there. Bring just the combination of the collaboration of this has been phenomenal. And I, and I was expecting to do four or five interviews. We got twenty people signed up. And so we're doing really dinner at big. the Rosewood that night. Is that right? Is that the is an event at the Rosewood? Is that correct? Um, well, we're going to probably have a. a dinner somewhere around our office in Palo Alto, Jefferson style dinner. So networking. So, you know, we're bringing this digital twin. We're replicating an event we had before, creating a digital program around it and then face-to-face -face networking. So um, just some really cool innovation. Just it's, the collaboration from the community has been phenomenal. So it's been great. And so look, take a look for that. And and uh, I'll see you next week for Super Club 7. Awesome. Dave. We'll see you out there, John. Safe travels. All right. Thanks, buddy. See you next time.